Hello everybody and welcome to another episode of Find Your Model Health, the official podcast of Shemaine's Model Health for those looking to optimize their long-term health and weight goals and understand how their body actually works. So as a follow-on from our last episode, this is part two of biohacking your sleep. So we're going to move on in this episode and look at some supplements, some foods, um, kind of setting yourself up or getting ready for bedtime um, and using as many hacks that you can to optimize the quality of your sleep so that when you wake, you're going to be able to perform optimally. So before we move on, I must emphasize that the information in these podcasts is for informational purposes only and should not be taken as medical advice. Please do consult with your health practitioner before implementing any lifestyle changes or adding any supplements or anything like that. Okay, so in the last episode, we looked at kind of how important good sleep is, the negatives and the positives of having good and bad sleeps, uh, how to set up your room, how to start getting ready to optimize your sleep. But now we're going to just go a little bit further on how you can add on to that stuff that hopefully maybe you tried last night. So one thing I like to encourage as much as I can and my sister will probably say I'm a pain in the butt but I try to encourage people to stay as consistent as possible with their sleep wake times so going to bed by their circadian rhythm so what this means is that going to bed and waking up at the same time every day increases the quality of sleep and has been shown to decrease health risks so for me it's I usually am bed by 10 p.m hopefully asleep by then and then up around 6 a.m so that's my sleep cycle and even on the weekends I try to keep it like that and I know you're saying well what about nights you go out you know they're the nights I that I stay out late like they're very rare like maybe twice a year three times a year they're obviously the exceptions and on those days I will sleep in later and make sure that I'm catching up on my sleep based on like how dehydrated I am how tired from say dancing or whatever it may be so there are going to be those exceptions but the majority of the time even on weekends you're trying to stick to your circadian rhythm and like I've I'd be lying if I didn't say it bugs me a little when someone says, but it's my weekend off, like I'm just going to sleep in. And you know, I get it, but because I come from such a health first point of view and I'm so passionate about it, I'm like, that's not really an excuse though. Just because you have no work on Saturday or Sunday, like you're just hurting yourself by sleeping in unless you were sick or something and absolutely needed it, of course. But by sticking to your natural circadian rhythm as much as you can and keeping those sleep cycles as regular or consistent as you can, you can help balance your body temperature at night, of course, and that's going to help you get into a better sleep. Um, And then, of course, that's going to support your immune system as well. So try to follow a lot of what I said yesterday, well, yesterday in the last podcast um, with all those hacks of keeping your room as dark as possible, as quiet as possible, um, at the right temperature so that you can get into that deep sleep. So there are then some nutrients that can help with falling asleep and improving sleep quality. And I know a lot of you are eager to hear what these are. Like, she might stop rambling. Okay. So... I'm going to assume that you're already following what I'm saying and having good nutrition practices throughout the day. 
So supplements and adequate nutrients in your diet can support the body in the production of melatonin. They help your body to relax, they support your adrenals, they induce proper brainwave patterns, um, and some of these brainwave patterns are associated with that N1 phase that we looked at in the last podcast. So that N1 phase is where you're slowly starting to get into a sleep and starting to relax, kind of that kind of meditative state. But some of these nutrients that have studies behind them um, are the following. Now, before I go on, some will work for many people and some won't. Magnesium works for a lot of people doesn't work for others, doesn't work for me. Um, So it's going to be very individual. So there might be a bit of trial and error and that is what biohacking is. But I don't want people to spend a fortune. If you were confused about what supplement you think would be best for you, of course, reach out to me, email me, message me on Facebook and I'll try help narrow you down which one would be good to try first or even which two. So first we look at magnesium citrate. Um, This acts as a mild sedative that helps the body to relax and fall asleep. It also increases the amount of deep sleep and decreases cortisol levels throughout the night. An appropriate dosage is usually 300 to 400 milligrams. You got to watch bell tolerance. Some people will have a low bell tolerance with magnesium citrate, but not everyone, Um, especially if you combine it with, say, magnesium sulfate or Epsom salt bath or something, then you're doubling up on that magnesium concentration getting into your system. Magnesium citrate is one of my favorites to recommend. It helps a lot of people and it is being shown to be very supportive of the thyroid too. So that's why I kind of tilt more towards that one rather than some of the others like magnesium glycinate or magnesium taurate. They are These two also provide amino acids that support liver functions at night and they can help some people with sleep. So the dosage for those magnesium glycinate and magnesium taurate is going to be between and this is quite a big range 200 and 1000. So that's where milligrams sorry and that's where your trial and error is going to come in. Another supplement is potassium citrate or potassium carbonate. Potassium combined with the magnesium can work synergistically so they work well together and doing this can help lower the incidence of kind of spasms throughout the night in your limbs, cramping of the muscles and kind of stop any internal interferences from your body that may be affecting your sleep quality. So if you're waking up with charley horse or cramps or spasms throughout your muscles or any sort of pains, this combination can work quite well of adding some potassium with your magnesium. Okay, next one is is one that I like a lot it's tryptophan. So tryptophan acts as a precursor to serotonin. So what the precursor means, it's basically part of the building blocks that help build serotonin and then melatonin. So tryptophan levels can be elevated in the evening by consuming some foods um, like whiter brown rice. Now, some of these foods, some of my clients are going to say, but I, you told me not to have them. Yeah, I'm just going through the list of the highest containing tryptophan foods and then you'll know which ones that are going to be best for you based on what I've told you is best for your goals, if that makes sense. So you're going to consume these um maybe in your last meal or if you're really struggling with sleep you could even go as close to two hours before going to bed not that i like that too much i like my clients to stop eating three to four hours before bed but if there's big sleep concerns two hours before bed with something containing some foods containing tryptophan 
can be helpful. Again, remember that trial and error thing, okay? So we're looking at pumpkin seeds, uh, turkey, chicken, eggs, some nuts, sesame seeds, um, again, white or brown rice. I would prefer that it was sprouted, of course. White fish, avocado, but not too overripe. Um, and then if you can combine foods containing calcium and vitamin B6, they can help with the absorption of tryptophan too. So that's going to be more along your animal products will have that kind of covered um, and some greens too so looking at the foods for tryptophan your last meal of the day would want to be pretty balanced if that was the road you were going to go down or alternatively of course you could use some sort of supplement so theanine the next supplement is Theanine, which increases alpha waves and can be helpful for falling asleep. Experiments with rats have shown that theanine improves the quality of sleep when coffee has been ingested during the day. Green tea is a good source of theanine. And I know that many of my clients and myself in our morning routine is going to be green tea followed by a good high grade coffee but that is something that can help with falling asleep if you're doing that along with your sunshine in the morning along with your morning exercise you're grounding the whole lot you're you're setting yourself up well for a good sleep so taurine I'm not such a fan of this, but in some people, taurine has been shown to decrease stress and anxiety and increases the amount of the anxiety inhibiting neurotransmitter GABA. Um, GABA, I've spoke a lot about before. I do like GABA as a supplement as well for sleep and helping with anxiety. Um, you're looking at dosages for taurine and even GABA between 500 and 1500. GABA generally the pills 500 um, can be more than enough for some people. You've got some trial and error there, but taurine is going to be 500 to 1500 milligrams of taurine every night, one hour before bedtime. GABA, again, 500 milligrams can be more than enough. I like to start people off with 150 milligrams and then see how they go. I respond well to 150 milligrams of GABA. It nips any anxiety in the bud straight away. But I don't have that severe anxiety. It's more like work-related or finance-related. Um, so people that have more severe anxiety, they might be be looking at increasing that amount of GABA up to 500 milligrams. So don't like to go anywhere over 500 milligrams. And you would do that two to three times a day or as you feel you need it. So if you feel anxiety coming on or if you're feeling stressed before bed, that's when you take GABA. Um, just to, to highlight that a little bit more, when I take GABA, it's usually when I start to feel those butterflies or a bit of anxiety or I'll go, uh-oh, this is giving me anxiety and I'll pop my GABA pill and within a few minutes, those neurotransmitters have been stopped and I feel okay. Like I really feel okay. I'm like, oh, phew, I feel okay now. So it can be very beneficial. Um, zinc is another supplement most people well most of my clients are getting adequate zinc and some will take um, extra zinc so zinc naturally raises testosterone levels and studies have shown that sufficient levels of testosterone have been shown to help improve the quality of sleep one of my favorite foods for testosterone um, and for zinc is raw organic pumpkin seeds. So I like to encourage them into my clients' diets. They can be really, really helpful. Um, vitamin D as well. Even if you are getting sun exposure, 
in this day and age we deplete our nutrients and minerals so fast with just how we live it's just society there's not a lot we can do about it except stack conditions in our favor even if you are getting a lot of vitamin d during the day from the sun so the sun helps us synthesize vitamin d ourselves it's still wise to take some extra vitamin d especially if you know that you're already predisposed to depression or moodiness or anxiety that extra vitamin d can really go a long way and as a side note there are a lot of studies that support vitamin d and fat loss that the higher your levels of vitamin d are in the body the better the fat burning capability so just something to think about there so taking vitamin d in the morning or during the day of course with fatty foods because fat's essential for the absorption of vitamin d Um, that can be very helpful you don't want to take it in the evening since vitamin d can interact with melatonin production okay so my clients know that they take their vitamin d usually with their first meal unless i've specified vitamin d again can interact with the production of melatonin so this also Like I don't want to go off on a tangent too much between sunlight and vitamin D and DHA and energy of the mitochondria and stuff. But vitamin D taken earlier in the day, if you find you're someone that crashes or has energy lulls or struggles with energy during the day, if there's any chance that some melatonin and cortisol are out of balance or disrupting each other, taking vitamin D earlier in the day or even around noon can help a lot with energy um so that's something to bear in mind too i mean there's a lot to bear in mind in here okay so when we look at um i'm just gonna look at a few more other supplements because people are always asking about these so one i've been trying lately myself and excuse me it has been it's been beneficial for me and I've seen it beneficial for um, another client who started it this around the same time as I started messing around with it is 5-HTP so 5-hydroxytryptophan so um, these guys are more of a you've tried a lot of the other stuff you need that kind of extra boost so we look at 5-HTP and usually it's in the range of 100 to 300 milligrams so i usually start people on 200 milligrams because those are the people that i know they need help with sleep and i go with 200 milligrams myself like on hot nights when i can't sleep and there's a lot of interruptions um i'm hesitant to go higher than that but it's still safe to go up to 300 milligrams and you would take that about an hour before going to sleep um, to give it time to kind of kick in. That effect can be augmented, of course, um, by taking other stuff, maybe alcohol or other supplements. But most of the time, people are just doing their evening routine, um, take their supplement and off to bed. Also, I get a lot of questions about melatonin. So melatonin in the ranges of 0.3 to 3 milligrams an hour before going to sleep can be beneficial for a lot of people. Melatonin honestly does nothing for me. I don't have problems falling asleep and getting into that good quality sleep in the first half of the night um, and I think that's why melatonin doesn't do anything for me but the 5-HTP does but I, some people swear by melatonin as well you don't want this to be a long-term supplement it's just going to be kind of a crutch for now while you figure out what's going on with your sleep and to help you kind of get a good rhythm going of sleep so melatonin shouldn't be a long-term thing because it will cause your body to downregulate its own production of its melatonin hormones so um that that's important to remember that because people think you can take melatonin over the long term and they'll be fine and that's not a good idea you don't want to be messing around with your own natural hormonal cycles 
So there's some support that shows that B6 taken before sleep um, can help with remembering your dreams. If you're interested in that, um, you're looking at about 240 milligrams of vitamin B6. I know some people like to, so I just thought I would throw that in there. So a good vitamin B6, of course. Um, I'm following on from what I said with tryptophan. So you remember tryptophan is a precursor of serotonin and melatonin. You can get a slightly stronger version, um, L-tryptophan, in supplement form. You would take this one to two times a day, preferably at night, and it's best absorbed when ingested with carbohydrates. Vitamin, so I'll we said that tryptophan was a precursor to serotonin and melatonin so 5-HTP is also a precursor but L-tryptophan is a precursor to convert to 5-HTP so in order to support that conversion we can add in some folate and vitamin C there too Okay, so there is a lot to remember there. So those are kind of the main supplements. Um, we can look at some more food types and beverages. So I suppose we'll look at beverages first because I'm a big tea proponent and in my clients' evening routines, they are giving choices of calming teas to help support their body throughout the night. But some beverages that will typically help with sleep are going to be valerian, chamomile, um, passion flower, cava can help as well. Uh, peppermint I've seen help a lot of people because it can help support the central nervous system and relax people. I like turmeric and ginger tea as well because they can be beneficial for the gut, like very beneficial for your gut. And we know that the majority of our serotonin is made in our gut, so I like them for that. You do want to try stay as hydrated as you can in the evenings and even throughout the night especially if you've consumed any sort of diuretics like alcohol or caffeine or anything like that later in the evening so some people I'll hear will complain about drinking tea in the evening and about getting up so many times during the night and I will remind them that making sure that you're getting adequate salt into your diet is going to help prevent you getting up. Your liver is typically active mostly between 1 and 3 a.m. Most people see around that 3 a.m. mark um, and wakefulness during the these hours can be a sign of dehydration too. So not only do you have to get up to pee, but you might want to take a couple of sips of water before you go back asleep there and too. Um, so that is something. Try avoiding substances that disturb your sleep as much as possible. Caffeine five to eight hours before going to bed is usually a good idea. We all metabolize caffeine differently. So for the majority of people, stopping drinking anything containing caffeine after 2 p.m. is going to be a smart idea. Um, a lot of people, I'll say noon, just to be on the safe side. Um, and that will that will pretty much suffice. So be, stop your caffeine between noon and 2 p.m. Try to avoid um, foods that contain theobromine and theophylline. You can find that really in cacao. So watching your dark chocolate consumption in the evening. For some people, not everyone is going to be important. Um, limit a late evening alcohol assumption as much as possible because alcohol reduces that rapid eye movement sleep and we looked at how important that was for regeneration in the last episode so try to not drink any later than 90 minutes before going to bed and make sure you have a lot a lot of water there too so then for some people and I mentioned this to some of my clients a while ago a substance called thyramine found in foods like 
bacon and cheese and eggplant and potato and sauerkraut tomatoes and wine um spinach too that can increase the production of noradrenaline which boosts brain activity and keeps you awake so you might want to play around with avoiding those foods in the evening and see how that helps so you're going to have to go back and take some notes there play around do a little bit of elimination and see if that helps your sleep there's obviously a lot that plays part in sleeping um, and sleep quality so that's why i like these podcasts you can go back you can take notes and then you can do your own trial and error there too so Apart from that, it's very, very important that you, one, try to empty your mind of the worries of the day before going to bed. Whatever you've done by bedtime, it's enough. Everything else can wait until the next day. Um, After a long day, whatever you've done, you've had kids or you've had a big workload, it's if you get it is easy to get stuck with these thoughts these incessant thoughts and they will stimulate brain activity and they'll cause you to worry and they'll give you anxiety and they will play a part in preventing good sleep even I've seen with some clients who are overachievers, they worry, is the house clean enough? Is everyone happy? Is everyone taken care of? And these are like subconscious thoughts. Everyone is fine. Everything will be okay. Everything, nothing important is going to need to be done. That can't wait until the next morning when you're functioning better after a good night's sleep. If you're finding that you've anxiety before bed, try use meditation watch those electronics an hour before bed make sure you're stopping working an hour or two optimally before bed write down a list of to do things for tomorrow i find that really helpful i do it all the time so i know where i'm going what i'm doing and i tick things off because i love that sense of achievement it makes me feel like i've achieved something so that gives me that extra boost of dopamine and serotonin to make me feel good um so Even if there's something that you meant to do today, but you didn't get finished or didn't get done, write it down for tomorrow so that idea does not get stuck into your head. Gratitude journaling, of course, we all know is being shown to be very beneficial. Um, So do that. I do it first thing in the morning, but you can do it in the evening. Um, And any positive affirmations, and they can just be simple, like um, I am strong, I am beautiful, I am smart, or I am doing my best, or today was a good day. Just positive affirmations, and you would just repeat them every day. Now, One last thing, and I left this to last, is blood sugars and its effect on sleep. And there are many studies that connect blood blood sugar irregularities with poor sleep quality. And I'm not just talking about diabetics, but your average Joe that doesn't realize how insulin resistance works or doesn't realize the impact that this would have on their sleep. There are instances so looking at the obvious with diabetics if blood sugar levels drop during the night it releases uh, glucose regulating hormones like adrenaline and cortisol and growth hormone and they'll wake up and they'll have this massive spike in blood sugars as their liver is trying to compensate but for some of us as well if we're going to bed too hungry or we haven't had enough and maybe we train too much our blood sugars can drop and our cortisol can spike during the day and that'll wake us up during the night so again it's the same concept of that cortisol your body goes into a stress state it's like oh my god I'm starving something's going to kill me now and it wakes you up but there's also those people that eat too much sugar during the day and sugar during the night and this prevents them from getting into a good night's sleep as well so this very much is trial and error the majority of people that I work with 
period or that may be due intermittent fasting find that when they stop eating several hours before bedtime they have the best sleep ever but there are some people that have severe cortisol or adrenal dysfunction or dysregularity that might need some sugar in the evening to help them go to sleep so um, for people like that it is how do I say this sugar in the evening can help some people that have a lot of stress issues or cortisol issues or that maybe have higher stress um levels later on in the day and having some sugar can help bring those cortisol levels down and induce the serotonin if this is you I would encourage you to try some fat first so that will provide your body with some stable energy throughout the night to keep that cortisol low so it doesn't spike because you're say hungry or your energy levels drop so one or two tablespoons of MCT oil or some good omega-3 oil 30 to 60 minutes before bed can really help and you could just mix it into your tea and that's going to provide you with enough energy to get you through the majority of the night without your body getting too stressed for some people one or two tablespoons of collagen can be really helpful with those aminos and for others and I have done this with some of my diabetic clients or more so my hypoglycemic clients where we'll do some raw organic honey to help replenish the liver's glycogen stores before bed so usually I'll say like we'll play around and I'll say maybe a half a teaspoon to a teaspoon of honey and see how they get on Um, and then over time the body will adapt and it doesn't need it anymore so there is a few things that can be helpful for a lot of people who have a lot of stress later on in the evening so there's a lot of supplements there there's a lot of teas there there's some ideas um when we look at teas there's also a big trend with adaptogens now so you can also look at some holy basil and ashwagandha tulsi is a great one rhodiola is a great one those are especially adaptogens are especially great for people that have very stressful lifestyles they have a lot of stress um reishi mushroom is a very popular adaptogen now and you can get it in all different forms i prefer a reishi um elixir that's not too sweet or anything i'm very conscious of again those insulin levels and insulin resistance and sweetness of stuff so reishi really is a great one though it can help but adaptogens are more along the lines for those people that have a lot of stress in their life if i was to say if you were to say okay shemaine like i'm not sleeping well i'm gonna do everything you said in the last podcast i'm gonna like hack my bedroom make sure everything's right but I want to try a supplement tonight and maybe a tea. Um, what would be your top recommendations? So apart from everything else, I would first encourage you to try magnesium citrate, 300 to 400 milligrams. Um, and my second supplement that I would get you to try then would probably be GABA so GABA would be next and I'd say let's try 150 to 300 milligrams of that and see how you get on those would be my top two then for tea so you would take one of those supplements if you were going out to the shop today those are your two choices of supplements and then for teas I would say chamomile 
is going to be your best and it's been used for hundreds of thousands of years um, and valerian so try one of those two teas so there you have two options of supplements that i'd say try first off and two options of tea so try them do your evening routine set your bedroom up watch substances that may disturb your sleep later in the evening with your alcohol caffeine and sugar make sure you're getting a lot of sunshine and hydration throughout the day and you really have between these two episodes you really have some of the top hacks for hacking your sleep now before we go off i just want to look really quick at measuring your sleep some people like to measure their sleep some people not so much but the option is there and it can be very helpful for some people um the history of collecting data on the physiology of sleep goes back well to the late 19th century. Um, even Sigmund Freud was already interested in dreams in the time well before the invention of EEG and proper understanding of REM sleep. So tracking your sleep is not necessarily something new or trendy. Um, it's been around for a long time, but it can be very helpful. Um, so you can for there's a lot of apps you can get on your phone you can get activity trackers and watches that have a sleep tracking function you can get jewelry um, like smart rings like the aura ring you can get pendants uh, you can get sleep trackers that will sense body movements during your sleep using radio waves um, you can get trackers that are placed underneath your bed sheets and they kind of are the preferred option or the best option if you were to go the full hog into self-quantification or even quantifying your sleep those would be the best those sleep trackers so they're pads that are placed underneath your bed sheets and they will track your movement and your breathing and all that while you're asleep you can get sleep trackers fastened to your head that sense eye movements but not only financially but this is not feasible for everyone to do um and then heart rate belts they some of those can measure your sleep quality too if you're looking at an app i know iphone has many apps that track your sleep but one of my favorites and the one i use will be sleep cycle so that's the one that i use and i encourage my clients to use and it's available on android too i'm not sure about the other platforms but sleep cycle it has a free version and then of course it has the premium version but i found that the free version is just as effective in tracking your sleep um so you can look into that again that's called sleep cycle so it is possible to get adequate kind of measurements tracking by simply using your phone so um you will get some idea of the quality of your sleep if you did want to go that one step further you could get those trackers that go into your beds sheets or the smart rings or i mean if you're willing to spend the extra money you can get contactless body movement sensors um, and they're the least likely to cause any disruption but otherwise activity trackers heart rate belts and other stuff um, can be effective some more comfortable than others so before we finish up to maximum so here's in summary to maximize your sleep quality we're going to Aim to get into REM sleep as much as possible. Make sure we're getting into deep sleep as much as possible. For the majority of us, we're going to aim for seven to eight hours of sleep a night. We're going to try fall asleep quickly. So we're going to do our evening routine. We're going to maybe take that magnesium or the GABA and do the valerian tea or the chamomile or some of the other supplements or teas I've mentioned. I'm going to maybe do... A hot bath if you can or some sort of meditation or relaxing protocol in the evening we're going to try avoid exposure to led lights or blue lights for an hour optimally two before bedtime we're aiming for little to no waking up during the night so go to the bathroom before you go to sleep make sure you're getting enough salt into your diet as well um so that might 
can help a lot of people not get up during the night to pee as well make sure that you're in a relaxed state so that you you're not waking up stressed during the night or stress is not waking you up so whatever makes you feel good maybe it's reading a book maybe it's listening to classical music in the evening maybe it's sex with your spouse whatever it may be to put you in that parasympathetic state is going to help keep you in a nice quality of sleep throughout the night and keep your heart rate and blood pressure and everything in nice zone um try if you want to use some kind of natural soundscapes if you feel that helps you otherwise as quiet a room as dark a room as cool as room as possible so you guys have a lot to go on there like there's a lot I think I may or may not do a follow-up podcast I haven't decided yet on napping we'll see we'll see but right now you have more than enough information between the two podcasts I think you've got almost an hour and a half of listening there which is a lot so they're yours keep them go back over them take notes this stuff works and helps but with biohacking and self-quantification there is going to be some trial and error so you're going to try a bit of what um you think might work for you um and see how you get on I really wish you all the best of luck and if you have any questions do direct them towards me you can go to my website shemainsmodelhealth.com and you can click on email there or you can find me on Facebook under the same name um, or even on Instagram okay so I'm going to leave it there please do share with anyone you may feel um, could benefit from the information in these podcasts it really helps me reach the masses and if you don't know by now I'm just really passionate about making a difference in the world that that's all it is I just want to make a difference help people be their best Um, enjoy your day have a lovely weekend and we'll chat again soon bye-bye